Welcome everyone to Interface Wears part three of our Did You Know webinar series, Developing Interfaces 101. This topic is relevant for all Iguana users, whether you are a beginner or an expert user of our platform. We hope today's webinar is informative, addresses any frequently asked questions, and helps you maximize your interface development within Iguana. Some of today's highlights include applying design considerations to Iguana channels to improve performance and reliability, a deeper dive into Lua programming in the Iguana translator, exploring different non-HL7 types to understand how Iguana handles them, and learning database integration tips and tricks to build faster and reliable database integrations. My name is Prashant Sri, and I'm the product marketing lead here at Interfaceware. In today's session, we are here with two Interfaceware staff members, Aaron, a solutions engineer, and Rega from our customer solutions team, answering all your questions live throughout this webinar. At any time, we encourage anyone to ask any question using the Q&A box located within your Zoom window. No question is a bad question, and we will do our very best to answer your inquiry in real time. The questions can be about today's presentation or about any iguana related questions you may have. Our presenter will also be doing a few anonymous polls throughout the presentation, and we encourage everyone to participate and provide your feedback. As we normally do, we will also be sending out a post event recap email Monday morning, so look out for that in your inboxes with this video recording and additional resources specific to today's presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome today's presenter, my colleague and our speaker today, Abner Usi. And he is one of our experienced solutions architects here at Interfaceware, having joined about a year ago. He's an expert in all things Iguana and has worked with a variety of our clients ensuring Iguana is used in the best way possible. And I look forward to seeing what he has to say today. On a side note, a few, a few cool things I learned about Abner recently when I met with him for the first time last week was that he does love all things concerning IT and loves developing on the side. He is also a big foodie and loves to try new foods in new places whenever he can and creates his own vacations around food as well. So it is now my pleasure to welcome Abner. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the third part of our Did You Know webinar series. This time we'll be talking about developing interfaces 101. Uh, in this section, we will explore a list of best practices for developing interfaces that can help you keep your iguana channels running smooth and issue free down the road. Customers reach out from time to time if they experience downtime or performance issues on their servers. These hiccups could be avoided using our best practices, and we'll review these today. So today we'll focus on one, tips on developing interfaces, shedding light on topics that may, you may not know about, uh, two, how to create better designs, focusing on scalability, performance, and reliability, and lastly, our overall goal with this session is to learn how to keep your interface running smoothly. So for the webinar's agenda, we'll first explore Lua of programming and cover how Iguana processes scripts. Once we ha have an idea of how scripts are executed under the hood, we will apply these topics to our database integration uh, to speed up our database connectivity and implement reliable code. Understanding databases will lead us to our third topic, design patterns, where I will show you three different design patterns that have helped, uh, that will help your channels run smoothly. And lastly, we will discuss our best practices on integrating non-HL7 data types. Without further ado, let's start with our first topic, Lua programming. So, how many of you are familiar with Lua? Trick question, all of you should know Lua because Iguana runs on the script. Uh, I mean, Lua, uh, Iguana runs on Lua, uh, but do you really know Lua and uh, how to implement it with Iguana? And that leads us to our first poll. 
how confident are you in programming in Iguana? Okay, so you guys should see the poll now. The main reason why I wanna ask this question is mainly how confident in Iguana are you programming? Uh, I've been programming with Iguana for about a year or so and using the translator auto annotation and all the scripts and everything, uh, it just really helps with programming in general. Um, it's, it's really great for, especially when you're looking for an HL7 field, uh, if you just do like OBX square brackets one, the rest of the fields will automatically show up and it's really easy to find. So I kind of want to see how everyone else feels. So I'll give this about 20 more seconds. Most people have voted, about 28 have voted. Me personally, I feel pretty confident programming in Iguana, but if I were to use Lua elsewhere outside of Iguana, then it'll be a little bit of a different story. So I'm gonna end the poll here and we can see the results, actually a pretty good bell curve. Uh, we have about 28% people very confident, about 41% need more practice and about 31% haven't used it before, which is perfectly fine. This webinar is open to everybody and even leads. And I highly recommend using Iguana, even just like a trial demo. And yeah, you'll, you'll understand how great it is to develop in it. So for this topic or for this uh, webinar, oh, uh, yeah. so for this webinar, we are going to talk about advanced programming or advanced loop coding. And why do we need to know about advanced coding? And why is it important? So a common request that we get is how to improve performance when messages are not processing fast enough. The main thing to ask is why are the message, uh, why are messages being processed slowly? And in most cases, there can be improvements made in the Lua coding. Actually, let me share a story. So when I first applied to Interfaceware, part of the interview that I had was to make a simple interface uh, using Iguana and Lua. And I'm sure the developers on this call know technical coding interviewers, uh, very terrifying. The interviewer <laughs> kind of just knows more than you and uh, they, they, they just see you coding in person and it's really nerve wracking. <laughs> but uh, so during the interview, I showed the, the interface I developed. And one of the main questions they asked was, how do you make it faster? And at first, I didn't really understand the question, mainly because the code executed like in milliseconds, there, there was no need for it to go faster, right? But what I learned, and when you work with Iguana, it's a bit different than simply executing a program, and that's it. Your code is executed each time a message comes in. And when thousands of messages are coming in at a time, uh, even if your code takes just more than a second to execute, it might not be able to process high traffic. That's why performance is so important to keep your interface stable and to ensure your messages are processing fast enough. Advanced coding is also great for troubleshooting, understanding Lua errors and how your code is implemented will allow you to quickly find the root cause and resolve any production issues. This will ensure minimal downtime or prevent it altogether. Lastly, learning advanced coding will enable you to do more with Iguana. Once seemingly impossible tasks are now possible using coding techniques. I'll cover three topics. And the first one is everything above main executes once. The main function is used in almost all programming languages, including Lua. Normally, scripts would run from line one and downward, with the main function being the starting point. However, this works a little bit differently with Iguana, and I will go over uh, how the code is executed under the hood. So let's have a look at this code. We have the main module on line four, and above that, we have a constant and a require statement. When the script, uh, when the channel starts, the script will run from line one, then to line two. Here we go into module.lua and set const to one, then jump back into main.lua and start executing the main function. 
on line four to five, we call mod.func. Uh, then execute line five to seven of module.lua. Lastly, we end the script on line six to seven of main.lua. All this happens the first time you start a channel. And the keyword here is start. So let's say now the channel has been running and a message comes in. Uh, and this message comes in and triggers the translator script. Now, the only lines that execute are lines four to five of, from main.lua. Then we jump into module.lua and execute lines five to seven and finish the script to going back into the main on line six to seven of main.lua. When a new message comes in, only main.lua is processed and everything above the main is only executed once. So, and that's on channel starter. Here's another example. So this is a simplified example based off a previous request where a customer wanted to improve the performance of their script. Let's say you have a template XML here and you wanna parse it. You can see how inefficient this code is. Every time a message comes in, the template has to be reassigned. A better implementation would be the following. Here we have the template above the main. The template will get assigned once, which is on channel startup. And when messages come in, uh, when messages come in, the parsing can happen right away without the need to define the template every time. Uh, it might seem that this is a trivial enhancement, but when hundreds of messages are coming in every second, small changes like this can go a long way in keeping your channels running smoothly. We'll talk about this more in our database topic. Uh, so keep this in the back of your mind. Moving on to our next topic, you can create patterns in Lua strings. You may be familiar with regex in other programming languages and Lua uses patterns to achieve a similar workflow. Sometimes when new data is received, you will need to extract certain information from the strings uh, to map it into your outbound message. Hard coding or brute forcing your way through the string may work, but this can cause performance issues or downtime down the road. Instead, you can use patterns and our string API to keep your channels running smoothly. This is a table list of all character classes you can use these to create patterns. Here's an example where uh, you can, here's an example where uh, we use the character class percent %d to create a pattern for the date. We can use string.find to find this pattern in the string and extract a substring date from it. We can take this further. The capitalized version of the character class represents the complement of that class. In this example, we use the capitalized percent %a to represent all characters other than letters. Normally, lowercase percent %a would represent only letters. Here we use g sub to replace the white space and exclamation mark with an underscore. Moving on, you can, use uh, you can make patterns even more useful with modifiers for repetition and optional parts. Patterns in Lua offer four modifiers plus asterisk, dash, and question mark. We have an example here uh, where there's a for loop that loops through each word in a string and prints out the word. This is done with gmatch, and the pattern is percent %a+, plus, which essentially means a word. You can get creative, and the options are endless when it comes to patterns. Uh, we have many examples in our string API for further reading, but your best resource would be Google. Simply searching Google for how you wish to manipulate a string in Lua, and a forum with either the answer or relevant information will come up. String manipulation is a common request, and learning about patterns will help you with your future development and also improving your existing code. Moving on to our next tip, how to avoid memory leaks. Anyone familiar with coding knows how annoying memory leaks are. Thankfully, Lua will automatically handle garbage collection and memory management, so there's no need to allocate the memory yourself. However, due to the high throughput of messages that come in, 
translator scripts can be executed hundreds of times a second. Just a minuscule amount of leaking memory will lead to your server running out of memory after a few days. These leaks could be avoided if you follow our best practices and these tips. First, we have global variables. All variables in Lua are automatically assigned as global variables unless you put local in front of its declaration. The misuse of global variables will cause a memory leak. Here you can see we have globvar. Uh, it is assigned as a global variable. As the channel runs, globvar will double in size until it is too large and causes a memory leak. Global variables do have their uses, but please use them with caution. And if you do, remember to assign a nil to the global variable if you want to remove it from memory. This helped one of our uh, customers solve a memory leak that they were having. Moving on to our next tip, not using persistent database connections. A persistent database connection is a single connection that is reused for all database queries. If you do not know what that means, don't worry. We'll go over that later in our database section. For now, just look at the database connection that we have here. If you receive high traffic, there will be a large number of database connections being opened and closed. This does not give the server enough time to close the previous connection before a new connection request is being made, leading to a memory leak. To avoid this, you can use persistent database connection, and I'll go over that in more details in our next topic. For now, let's recap what we learned and tie it back to the main focus of this webinar, which is how to keep your channels running smoothly. We talked about how everything above the main executes once. It's great to put constants or templates here so you don't need to execute them each time the script runs. Of course, what you decide to put above the main is completely up to you and certainly not limited to constants or templates. We use this workflow to improve performance and increase the throughput of all your scripts. Next, I showed you how to use patterns with the string API when extracting information from HL7 fields, some people uh, use hard-coded values or brute force their way through it. This works fine, but what if the sending system, for whatever reasons, decides to change their format slightly? Your script would either run into an error or, receive, or the receiving system will get incorrect data. Using patterns to avoid the situation, uh, using patterns will avoid the situation since you are looking for a specific pattern within a string rather than, for example, looking for a substring from position five to 10. Uh, on to our last topic, avoiding memory leaks. Learning how to avoid memory leaks is crucial when keeping your interface up and running to avoid memory related crashes. We have an entire help document on avoiding memory leaks for this section, I covered global variables and not using persistent database connection. I'll talk more about database connections in our next topic, database integration. So our second poll for today is, uh, are you using databases in Iguana? So let me just set that up. There you go. So you all should see a poll now. And the main question is, are you using databases in Iguana? From the requests that come in, I would say like most of them have a uh, database integration within Iguana. And it's, it, is, it is pretty interesting to see um, like how many people are using databases. So this entire topic will be covering you know, database integration, best practices for them. And I kind of want to get a gauge to see how useful this section will be and how many people will get affected by it. So we got a good amount of people that have answered so far. Uh, I'll wait maybe five more seconds so you can try to get your answers in quickly. And we have about 70% of participants. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and poll. So here are the results. As I was expecting like, this number exactly actually like a lot of people using database bases in iguana around like 80 to 90 percent so spot on there um yeah it's, it's really cool to see everyone using databases in iguana and we are going to go over some best practices that you may not know about um 
So let's just get right into that. Also want to just interject if anyone does have any questions, we do have Aaron and Natalie, uh, I'm sorry, Aaron and Rega uh, on online right now. So to ask any of your questions live, and it could be, once again, anything iguana related. Great. Thanks, Prashant. So why should we learn about databases and best, best practices? Well, databases are one of the most commonly used APIs in Iguana, and many customers have some form of database integration with Iguana. Databases become a key component with overall architecture, and customers want to ensure there's no problem with them. They want their databases to be reliable. Having a reliable database uh, mainly refers to keeping your database connection alive. The connection can be destroyed from network issues, not enough database threads, or if the database query is too large. Um, if your database integration does not account for this, errors will be thrown and your channel will stop, leading to downtime. We will go into examples of how to keep your database more reliable. Uh, the other reason why we need to learn about database best practices is performance. One of the main bottlenecks in translator scripts is related to database connection and operations. If a customer asked how to improve performance, one of the first things I check is if they're using databases. I would then add Iguana logs before and after each database operation to pinpoint where exactly in the code it's acting slowly. Most cases, people are not aware of our best practices for database integration, and I will show some tips and tricks uh, that can help our customer that have helped our customer keep Iguana uh, running smoothly. With that in mind, our first topic. You only need to connect to the database once per script. And that sounds familiar from our last topic. One of the main downtimes in database integration is connecting to the database. If a script takes a couple of seconds to connect to a database, the outbound message throughput will be slower than how many messages are coming in. If you only need to connect once to the database, this eliminates the problem. Let's dive into an example. Here, I have my script. Each time a translator executes, I connect to my database, uh, do a couple of database queries, and then I close the connection. This is fine if you're not receiving a lot of messages, but when hundreds of messages are coming in every second, this implementation is too slow. I had someone with this, this exact problem. We set up log debug messages, on each line of their code to see exactly where in the code was taking the longest. And it was the database connection, which took about three to five seconds. This caused their queue of messages to get backed up since their output was slower than their input. They had, um, they had their database connection within the main, and we fixed this by doing the following. Back when I was talking about Lua coding, I mentioned that everything above the main will get executed once, which is on channel startup. Afterwards, only the main function will get executed on each translator script. Looking at this script, the connection is established once when the channel starts, and it does not need to be reconnected each time the script runs. When a message comes in, the only processing that takes place are the two database queries. The connection also does not need to close since it will stay alive after the main executes. This is what we call a persistent database connection where a single database connection is reused for all database queries. Referring back to my client whose database connection was impacting their performance, uh, the moment we used persistent database connection, each message processed three to five seconds faster, an instant improvement and their queues emptied in seconds. There are some considerations to take when using a persistent database connection. On some databases, you have a limited number of threads. Having a persistent connection will use one of those threads. And if you have multiple scripts that use this, you may run out of threads. 
Also, this implementation is great for high volume workflows, but it is not necessary for low volume. Lastly, you may have noticed, but as the code is right now, uh, it's not really reliable. If the database connection is closed or destroyed, the database queries will fail and Iguana will error out. To avoid this, you would need to add retry logic, but did you know we have a module for retrying database connections? This module will check if the connection is alive before every database operation. To keep your channels running smoothly, you want to check for potential errors or failures in your code. As mentioned before, uh, database connections can be destroyed from external factors on your network, and you will need to check if the connection is alive to avoid errors in your script. Here is the, the example from before. Uh, before we query the database, we need to implement some logic to check if the connection is alive and retry the database connection. We have complicated steps on how to do this in an old help document, but we have developed a better solution. Instead of adding this long code to your script, all you need to do is the following. Add the db2.lua module along with its require statement and change your db.connect to db2.connect. And it's that easy. So what does db2 module do? Well, it will check the connection of your database before every database operation. If the connection is closed or does not exist, it will retry connecting. You can configure the database retries in that DB2 module. Uh, here, we have set the module to retry 100 times with 10 seconds between each attempt. Now, let's have a look at the database operation logic. Here is the code for db.execute. On the first line, it will try to reconnect itself calling the reconnect function. This function will call another function called init to check if the connection is alive. If not, then close the stale connection and retry connecting based on the parameters we set from before. All these functions are made with the DB2 module, so you don't need to worry about the specifics. The only thing, uh, the only change in your code will need to be adding the db2 require statement and changing db2.connect to db, uh, sorry, changing db.connect with db2.connect. So why should you add this? Well, many customers experience production failures, which could have been avoided if they implemented db2. These errors mainly come up from doing a database operation with a database connection that has been lost. Most of the time, you will want to use DB2. But of course, there are some considerations. DB2 and persistent database connections both require a thread to be available. You can't use this in a SQLite database since SQLite uses single thread, whereas SQL Server can use multiple connections. Otherwise, I would suggest using DB2 in almost every implementation. If you have questions regarding this or would like access to the DB2 module, you can visit our database connection help document. From there, you can import the example channel, which, is, which includes the DB2 module. Alternatively, you can get the source code for db2.lua and manually add it, uh, add, add it to a module from our help document here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask one of the support members on this call. So let's review what we talked about. Persistent database connections allow you to reuse single database connections rather than opening and closing a new one each time the script runs. This is important in keeping your channel stable because opening a database connection can take up to three seconds. Uh, and if this needs to be done for every message that comes in, your queue will get backed up. Next. We talked about DB2, which is a module that checks if your database connection is alive. Before every database operation, 
database connections can be closed from network issues, which will cause your database operation to fail. To ensure your channels run smoothly, you can avoid database connection errors using DB2. Now that we had, uh, now that we know uh, how to keep our database connections robust, let's move on to our next topic, design patterns. This refers to designing channels in certain ways to improve your workflow. In a previous webinar, we went over each design pattern already. So in this section, we'll cover three design patterns and how they can be applied. Now, why do we need to learn about design patterns? Improving your interfaces can go beyond just Lua code and using API. You need to think about the architecture as a whole. And the main thing that uh, will get improved are scalability, performance, and reliability. When customers are building complex interfaces that connect to multiple systems, these three factors are what they're looking for. Using design patterns, uh, using a design pattern helped one of our customers reach their performance requirements. In another case, someone wanted their interface to be scalable and we suggested another design. These patterns all have one thing in common and that is to produce clean code that will modulize uh, clean code that will modulize your interface. Uh, creating a separation of concerns will help you in the future if you run into errors and need to troubleshoot. Our first design patterns will be channel adapters. The general idea of the channel adapter is to connect with an external application, pull, or, pull for or receive messages, convert the format of the message for the channel queue, and put the message in the queue. Here are example channel configurations. The adapter can get messages from LLP, translator, or HTTP and send it outbound to the channel via LLP. The purpose of the channel adapter is to be flexible enough to connect to any source system and scalable to reuse for all use cases. Some examples are EMR adapters. From our previous webinar with Leanne, we went over building adapters to connect to Athena Health, Epic, and non-clinical ones such as Salesforce. In that webinar, we explained how to build your own adapters using the tools provided in Iguana. For EMRs, you can create custom VMDs and build your adapters using them, or create an API adapter that generates a Lua object that contains all the key details. For more information, you can check out Leanne's webinar, as well as our previous ones on our Interfaceware YouTube channel. You can also have a fire adapter to connect to any public fire server. We have a great help document on Iguana acting as a fire client. And lastly, you can use database adapters to map certain data into your messages. All in all, adapters are a great way to improve integration since it enables you to integrate with any source system smoothly. This leads to our next design pattern, the canonical data model. Let's say you have several incoming data types and you need to convert them to an outgoing format. For example, we have HL7, CDA, X12, and Fire coming in, and they need to be converted into XML fixed with CSV and some custom format. You can see how messy this is and how many channels you would need. It gets even more complicated if you want to add new formats. Instead of this, we can have something like this. Here we have the canonical data model where we convert all incoming data formats into one format, in this case, JSON, and each outbound format will convert from JSON. This eliminates the need for all the channels and decreases complexity. The benefit may not be great now, but if you have 10 or more formats, you'll instantly notice that the canonical data model works well. A customer once approached us asking if it was possible to send messages from their database to X12. 
they required the scalability for developing other X12 data formats. And we proposed the canonical data model to them. This allowed their interface to smoothly implement future X12 data formats. Moving on, our last design pattern is claim check. A common case that comes up is an HL7 message that comes in with a large file attached to it. Instead of processing the message as is, you can receive the message, remove the large data and replace it with an ID, store the data in a data store, then after all the processing, swap the ID with the data. Here's an example of this. We had a customer whose CPU usage was too high and their log size was exploding. This was because they were receiving messages with a PDF up to 500 megabytes large. Each time a message was parsed, the, PD, uh, the, the large PDF was also parsed and this workflow could have been handled better. We suggested the claim check design and their source system was able to separate the PDF and SFTP it to the production server. When the message came in, uh, the message had uh, the PDF replaced with a file name. And after processing the message in Iguana, the file name was replaced with the PDF and sent outbound. This eliminated the unnecessary parsing of the PDF in several channels. Their CPU usage and outbound message rate improved drastically and their entire environment used to be unstable before the, this design pattern was introduced. And now it's running smoothly. To summarize what we talked about, you can use channel adapters to connect to any source and push the received information to the channel queue. We have all the tools in Iguana for you to start creating your own adapter. And it is important to spend time creating clean code that can be used in all use cases. This enables smooth integration with any source system. Next, we talked about a way to convert data from many incoming formats to many outgoing formats using the canonical data model. This improves scalability when adding new data formats and simplicity for future development. If you run into an error, you can easily find where the problem is happening because the canonical data model will severely decrease the number of scripts. Finally, we talked about the claim check, which removes large files from incoming messages to decrease the processing required in Iguana. This will keep your log sizes and CPU usage low to ensure your server is stable. That covers all our design patterns. And now we'll go ahead and talk about our final topic, which is HL7 and beyond. Now that we have experience with HL7, we will explore how to tackle non-HL7 data types. This is our third and last poll. Let me go ahead and set that up for you. All right, so you should see the poll now. And the poll question is, have you or are you interested in integrating with non-HL7 data types? Most requests that come in are, are HL7 data types. We do see people asking about, hey, is Iguana able to you know, use Fire or use CDA X12? And yes, Iguana is. And it is something people are interested in and people have developed. And I just wanna know just um, from the audience, how many of you guys are interested? And yeah, we'll just let that run for a little bit while I take a sip of water. I see a lot of people are asking questions, which is great. All right, uh, I'll let this run for a little bit longer and I'll end the poll now and share the results. So as you can see, this is shocking, but 100% of people are interested in non-HL7 data type, which is great because Iguana is capable of being integrated with every data type. And it's great to see that everyone here is interested in non-HL7. So we'll start talking about some of that. 
All right. Uh, oops, I think I went a little bit too far. All right, here we go. So why non-HL7 and why is it important? Well, Iguana can process data types other than HL7. The healthcare industry is always changing and to meet new trends, Iguana is built to integrate with all data types. This is important for meeting vendor requirements. And while setting up with a new vendor, some customers reach out for help handling data types they're unfamiliar with. The goal of this section is to show our best practices for integrating uh, three popular non-HL7 data types. Our main focus will be the following. Moving data, parsing data, uh, building messages, and mapping. These four steps are important when considering data types. Our first data format will be CDA. CDA can be integrated with Iguana. CDA is an XML-based standard for encoding clinical documents to integrate with Iguana. First, we can send and receive data in many ways, mainly HTTP, LLP, SFTP, and from a database, or from a database. Uh, some CDA connectors use SOAP and HTTP to send and receive messages. For LLP, you can establish a persistent connection between servers for reliable data flow. And if your message is large, SFTP is the best way to receive them. Lastly, messages can be stored and queried in a database to enable specific SQL queries onto them. Moving on to parsing, since CDA is XML-based, you can parse messages using xml.parse. To build the message, we have our own CDA API. This is uh, here in this sample code. I created a new CDA document using cda.new, and I populate the field with, uh, with the clinical document. We have an excellent example of this in our help document, if you would like more information. Lastly, to map, you can use the annotations provided in the Iguana translator to find the specific XML element you're looking for. Here, I can find the node for custodial, uh, custodian organization and name it uh, organization name, and I map the name general hospital. Once again, we have this heavily documented on our help site. Next, X12 can be integrated with Iguana. X12 is a format for electronic data interchange or EDI and is used to exchange business documentation for CDA. We can send and receive data via HTTP, LLP, SFTP, and databases. For EDI, SMTP is legacy support and not commonly used in healthcare. Web, service, web services or HTTP is used for real-time communication and FTP is common, commonly used for EDI, mainly for batch processes and large data sizes. To parse X12 in Iguana, it's similar to HL7. You can use X12 API to call x12.parse, and you will need an X12 VMD for the specific version and type. Here we have X12.270 version three. Here is another example with multiple VMDs. We have eligibility, claim, service review, and acknowledgement. Moving on, to build the message similar to HL7, you will do x12.message to create an outbound message. Uh, this message can be used for mapping. And mapping, you can use the auto annotations to get specific field and assign a value accordingly. Here, I set authorization information qualifier to 00. zero. You can take this further um, by creating functions for filling segments. We have lots of examples in our help document 
that you can refer to. Overall, X12 is roughly the same steps as HL7, where you have a VMD for each type of message, then use our X12 API to parse and build the message. Moving on to our last topic, Fire. Fire can be integrated with Iguana. As healthcare trends are changing, Fire is becoming more popular. I'm sure most people in this call have heard of Fire in some way, shape, or form. It's a new kid on the block, and lots of people are wondering if it can get integrated with Iguana. To send data with Fire, it's a little bit different than how we did it with CDA and X12. So to, to send data with Fire, Iguana will act as a Fire client and send a web request to a Fire server. Here, we use net HTTP GET to do a read operation on the Fire server to receive data. To send data, you will do a POST request. Notice how you can specify the format from XML or JSON. Once you receive the data, you can parse it and change its contents. Here, I parse the data using json.parse and switch the patient's activity flag, serialize the JSON, and update the fire server with net HTTP put. To build a message, you will need to build the fire resource and populate each field. Here, I have the patient resource template created in one of my profiles. I assign the variable patient with my patient resource profile to build the message. Here, I'm just looking for the, the specific patient resource. You can even just type it in like that, and there it is, patient resource. To map, I populate the resource I created. Once done, I clear the empty nodes that were not used and serialize the JSON. That about covers it for all the steps for Fire. Using our API, Iguana can act as a Fire client and seamlessly integrate the two. To recap this topic, we talked about CDA. Since it's an XML-based format, we can use our XML API to parse the message and map the fields accordingly. We also have a help document that goes into details on building a CDA message. For X12, the process is similar to HL7, where you use a VMD to parse and build a message. Uh, this is all done with our X12 API. And lastly, for Fire, we showed how Iguana can act as a Fire client where it can receive and send information via HTTP requests. You can build a Fire resource using a template and map the data accordingly. All the lessons learned for integrating these three data types all apply to other data types as well. Whether it is CSV, SOAP, JSON, or XML, you can use our API to parse the message and you can build the messages using a template. Now that you know our best practices for developing non-HL7 interfaces, you can start integrating different data types smoothly to avoid future errors. And finally, we have reached the end of our webinar. To summarize, we talked about Lua programming, database integration, design patterns, and non-HL7 data types. I highlighted why these topics are important and how they can keep your iguana running smoothly. I hope that everyone here has learned something today. If you have questions uh, regarding the topics related to this webinar, feel free to reach out to our support team and we're happy to help. Thank you again for joining us in our webinar and I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you, Abner, for that really uh, productive and informative webinar. Really appreciated it. And I'm sure everyone here uh, really enjoyed it and uh, gained a lot of insight from it as well. Uh, to recap, we will also be sending out this webinar uh, Monday morning. Uh, so look out to your inboxes. We will be sending out that email with a recap uh, to our YouTube link and additional resources that may help supplement any of the information covered in Obner's webinar. 
Uh, as well, at the end of this webinar, we'll be doing a short survey as well. So please uh, give us your feedback, honest feedback. We're always looking to improve and always looking to make this experience optimal for each of you. So once again, thank you, Abner. Thank you to all who participated and uh, joined us uh, today. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one in December. Thank you.